to the channel. If I've got a silly grin on my face, it's because we've got a new car. And I say we specifically, um, but actually this is Mrs. Local's new car. So as you're probably aware, the last three years or so, Mrs. Local has been driving around in a, a John Cooper Works Mini, which we bought brand new in 2021. And it's been a fantastic car spec the car from new, pick the colour, all that kind of stuff, she's loved it, I've really enjoyed it, you've seen some videos on the channel, you know what a good car that Mini JCW is, but we were three years into the finance deal, we fancied a bit of a change, and honestly nothing to do with me, I didn't persuade her that, uh, that she should change for one of these, but yesterday we picked up the new car, and it's this, it's a Toyota GR Yaris hence the silly grin on my face. So I, you know, it was Mrs. Local's fourth Mini. We've had, you know, we've had Minis for nearly 10 years, maybe a little bit more than that, perhaps. And, um, you know, everybody's absolutely raved about this car. So we decided to dip our toe in and try one and see what we thought. So uh, we picked this up yesterday from Toyota in Darlington. Thanks to Ollie over there. Now, if you're thinking this might be the Mark II, GR Yaris, I'm sorry to disappoint you. That was announced a few weeks ago. I think you know, it's a facelifted version, got a slight increase in power, all that kind of stuff. Slightly different cockpit, an automatic option available. This is not the new GR Yaris. This is the Mark One, but we wanted an, you know, we wanted a car that we could get hold of because you just. You know, you've got to go online, you've got to order one of those, you've got to get an allocation spot. It might have been 12 months before we got a new car. So we looked around for a nice, low mileage, late model Mark 1 GR Yaris, and we found this one. It's a 72 plate, so late 2022. It's only about 18 months old. And it had done under 1,700 miles when we picked it up. It's just gone over 1,800 miles now. So it's been running, it's had the running in service. But it's effectively a brand new car. The car is mint, inside and out. And first impressions are absolutely fantastic. This is a great little practical driver's car. In fact, I go as far as to say this is probably the best practical driver's car that I've ever driven. Now I say practical driver's car very specifically, there are some driver's cars or sports cars that I've driven that have been a little bit better to drive than this. You know, I have driven things like McLarens and Caterhams and Ferraris and, you know, Porsche 911 Turbo S's and all, all sorts of really good exotic high performance cars. But this car is, you know, around £30,000. It's a hatchback, it's got four seats, it's a usable wieldy size, and most of the time it's not going to be driven enthusiastically, it's going to be driven by Mrs. Local, it's just going to be going to work in it, going to Asda in it, picking the grandkids up, all that kind of stuff. So for a car that's capable of doing all that, and that is very easy to use on a day-to-day on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I reckon this, this is the best one I've ever driven. Now I had a run of, say a run, I had a couple of Subaru Impreza's in the early 2000s. I had a year 2000 Mark 1 Impreza Turbo, and I chipped that in after a while for one of the first of the Bug Eye Impreza STIs when they came out. You're not into Subarus or anything, you're probably glazing over now, but uh, those of you that know those cars know what I'm talking about. So the the last impress that I had, and it's well over 20 years ago since I had that car, was the Bug Eyed STI. It's a four-door saloon, it's a 260 brake horsepower, similar to this, but this, all right, yeah, we're 20 years down the line, but this is head and shoulders better than that, and I drove a Mitsubishi Evo back in the day as well, an Evo 6, and I reckon this is a better car than both of those. Actually, I don't reckon. I know. Head and shoulders, this is a better car. Get it on a road like this. And this car is just epic. 
and it's partly to do with the size of it it's a nice small size but actually the secret behind this car is that this is a homologation special and you've probably all read about it and heard about the fact that the GR was originally designed to be the basis for a rally car the Toyota getting bigger and bigger into um, you're yeah, getting more and more into World Rally Championships and they wanted a car they could base a, a good rally car on and this is the basics. Now unfortunately the rules changed and they never did make a rally car out of this, um, out of this one. That's what I mean about it being a wieldy size overtakes like that or a piece of cake. So in terms of it being a Yaris, not really a Yaris this car, there's very little on it that's common with the other Yarises in the range. It's a two-door shell, it's the only two-door shell that they've made with the Yaris. Um, it's a much more of an aerodynamic shape which would help with when the engineers get their hands on it and want to turn it into a rally car. The body shell's been built down to a weight, so it's got aluminium panels, it's got very thin plastic bumpers on it. It's got a carbon fibre composite roof, keeps the weight down and keeps the centre of gravity a little bit lower as well. So even just starting with a body shell, Toyota have really set the stall out for what they want this car to be. The drivetrain is really impressive. It's a three-cylinder engine. I've driven a few cars with three-cylinder engines, they've never really impressed me very much. The last couple of Mini Coopers prior to the JCW that Mrs. Local had were 1.5 three cylinders and going back a few years I had a, a 2 series BMW with that little 1.5 three cylinder engine in it and it, you know it was a free revving little thing it was turbo but it you know, about 130 brake horsepower something like that in this car 1.6 three cylinder puts out around about 260 brake horsepower it's got a six-speed manual gearbox uh, and the gearbox is fantastic it's got a really nice mechanical so it, it's slightly weighted it um, it benefits from my favorite technique which is just taking your time slightly with the gear change you can bang it through but actually it benefits if you just pause at the neutral very slightly before you put it into the next gear the transmission has rev matching which is switched on and off with a switch down here so in the mini JCW it came on in sport mode and it went off in normal mode and you couldn't switch it on and off independently in this car you can just switch it on and off with a little switch down here and that gearbox is connected to a four-wheel drive system and it, it is a, a, another significant thing about this car that makes it such a good car to drive it has a four-wheel drive system uh, this is a circuit pack car, which uh, I think you could get a comfort pack and a circuit pack. There might be one other one, I can't remember what it was. Um, but if you look online, about 99% of all the cars that are for sale were specced with the circuit pack. So this, what the circuit pack gives you specifically um, is uh, it comes on different tyres. So the, the, I think the standard car comes on Dunlops. The circuit pack comes on Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. And if you know me, you know how much I like Michelin tyres, this 4S is a fantastic tyre, it's really good um, and it's really good in the wet as well, it's a fantastic wet weather tyre. The circuit pack also brings some adjustability to the differentials front and rear, so there's a switch down here, you can switch it from normal into sport or track mode and those different modes, as far as I can tell, they don't switch the engine mapping they don't give you a louder exhaust note or anything like that. What they do is they adjust the power delivery to the front and rear differentials. So in standard mode, when you switch this car on, it's 60% of the power going to the front wheels and 40% going to the rear wheels. Now, a lot of time on British roads, a little bit of front wheel drive bias is a good thing. So that normal rut mode, you know, I'm quite happy to leave it in that for most of the time when I'm driving. Now I need to explore the other settings before I give you a definitive view on them, but the other settings are Sport, which gives you 30% power delivery to the front axle and 70% to the rear, so it makes the car quite rear biased in Sport. And the third one is Track, 
track mold gives it 50 50 50 percent to the front 50 percent to the rear axle so over the next few months i'll have a play about with those when i drive this car and i'll give you a view on what my preferred settings are for different circumstances different roles that kind of stuff now there's something about this car that i really like you know i said before this is probably the best practical driver's car that I've driven and I've driven things like you know Audi RS3s, Mercedes AMG 45s, all that kind of stuff. Those are fast cars. The Golf R is a fast car. I remember driving a tuned Golf R a few years ago that had 500 brake horsepower. I mean absolutely ballistic but the numbers don't tell all the story. You know on paper with 260 brake horsepower the GR Yaris really is just somewhere mid-range amongst all the other hot hatches. But that's ignoring the heritage behind it. It's ignoring the motorsport engineering that's under the skin with this car. That starts with the body shell, stiffer, lighter, more welds, carbon roof, all that kind of stuff. Moves on to that transmission with adjustable diffs and torsion and limited slip differentials, front and rear as well something about the steering in this car that I really love now it's electric power steering it's not hydraulic and a lot of people bemoaned the loss of hydraulic power steering in most production cars a few years ago and electric power steering came in for good reasons came in for engineering reasons for efficiency reasons things like that but they've tuned this steering in a way that it is just so nice it's not quite as fingertippy as you'd get in something like a Porsche Cayman or a Mazda MX-5 or something like that but it is very accurate there's no slack in it at all and it weights up and here's the thing that they've done with the engineering in this car the steering weights up so we've got this corner coming up here get the speed and gear correct on approach and as I turn in with a bit of gas I can feel the steering weighting up and it's massively communicative it's telling me everything that little bump just on the exit of the corner then, I could almost tell you the angle and the depth of it just from the way the, the steering wheel shimmied when we went over. If you need to make a small adjustment mid-corner, you get it instantly. There's no slack in this car. There's no slack in any of its responses. The power delivery from the engine is very interesting. Like I said, 20-odd uh, years ago, I had a, an Impreza STI. And... Um, I love those impressors, they were great cars, made a fantastic noise to start with. But they were old school turbo cars, you know, there was nothing, there was nothing, there was nothing. And then the engine completely changed character and it gave you everything. Now this car, to be fair, up to about 2,000 revs, it is just a normal hatchback. So if you change up to six now, so, so I'm, I'm in six gear now, just under 2,000 revs about 40 miles an hour I press the gas it accelerates a little bit it's not complaining it's quite a throaty engine note engine note that engine note is piped into the cabin so take that with a pinch of salt but it's quite a throaty engine note if we change down to third we're above 3,000 revs now now the engine's nice and quiet but when I open it up You get a really linear throttle response. It's a really linear power delivery. It just comes in and it pulls and pulls and pulls and keeps pulling. Relentlessly, actually. The brakes, it's got uh, slotted, I think they're about 360 millimeter discs on the front and a nice big disc on the back. The brakes are, I mean really, everything you could ever need. They're epic. I'll give it a good squeeze now. Wow those brakes really really pull on and the ABS isn't too um, it, do, it doesn't interfere too much you can you can just hear a little bit of wheel lock then as, <laughs> as my GoPro fell off the passenger seat now I'm not somebody who relies on the brakes too much when I'm driving on the road I like to sort my speed on approach to a corner but that principle of being able to stop in the distance you can see to be clear this car gives you all that confidence and here's the next thing that it's really good at you, you, you would almost think and, and I suspect very strongly that it was that this car has spent quite a few development miles on British roads and I mean British roads like this 
bumpy, uneven, uncomfortable, rutted, bad tarmac, full of potholes, mud on the road, and this car laps it up. And this is where it's got an advantage over some of those more expensive driver's cars, sports cars, supercars. It's so stable. Part of that comes from the stiffness of the, of the body shell. Part of it comes from the compliance in the suspension. But you know, on a road like this, if I was in a, I don't know, a McLaren or, you know, a Ferrari, one of those cars, yeah, you'd have more power, yeah, your, your speed would be up, but start braking hard on this bumpy surface and those cars start to get a little bit, you know, they move around a lot. This car just laps it up. It just does it. You want to brake out hard? Yeah, no problem. We'll do that. Not an issue. And then we get to the handling. Um, the handling, the cornering capabilities of this car. Well, you know, to start with, it starts with that contact patch with the roll, and this car's on Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. If I was specking the car myself, that's the tyre I put on it. They're a lovely responsive tyre. There are grippier dry weather tyres, you could put cup tyres on it, you know, track day tyres, that kind of thing. But for everyday use, this tyre is perfect. Um, because it's also good in the wet, it's a fantastic wet weather tyre. The initial turn into a corner is nothing too sudden, but it's direct. There's no slack in the dead ahead position on this car. It will relax and it will drive in a straight line, but the moment you put a fraction of a turn on that wheel, just a few millimetres, you get an immediate response. So first turning is good. But because this car has a short wheelbase and four wheel drive, the thing that it's best at is changing direction. So if you've got a series of a couple of bends, a couple of little bends, where you're flicking from one to another, that's where this car absolutely comes into its own. That's where it is head and shoulders, I think, better than something like a Golf R or an Audi RS6. Now, not that those are bad cars, they are very, very good cars, but they're bigger and they're heavier than the GR Yaris. And you can feel that when you're flicking from a left-hander to a right-hander. Whereas this car, that lack of mass, the stiff body shell, the compliant suspension, the four-wheel drive, and the pull from that engine means that this thing really changes direction far better than you would expect it to. Now, in terms of everyday usability, it's fantastic. It's got everything you probably need and nothing that you don't need. Now, the one thing it's missing is that the circuit pack doesn't give you built-in sat-nav. So it's got this screen, it's got a few functions on here, you can connect your phone and all that kind of stuff, but it hasn't got a factory fit uh, sat-nav in it. It has got Apple CarPlay, you need a cable, I haven't got a cable with me at the moment, so you need to plug the, plug the phone in, you can use Apple CarPlay, so you can still get Google Maps and all that kind of stuff, and, it, and the Android equivalent, whatever that is, You've, it's, it's got all that. Uh, it has cruise control, radar cruise control actually, I was trying that out a little bit earlier, quite a good little system when you're just cruising up the motorway. It's got a nice effective climate control system. Um, the engine noise is pumped into the cabin, so it doesn't have a particularly loud exhaust. We did try one with um, an aftermarket back box on it, which did sound fantastic, but I think would have got a little bit much for, you, for an everyday car. We might have cheesed the neighbours off with that one, and it might have been a bit of a drone on the motorway when we're doing motorway miles. So we looked around for another one like, for this car, which has a standard exhaust on it. But the engine note is piped into the cabin through the speakers. Um, and it also does some clever stuff around noise cancelling as well. Um, so, you know, for all its performance, it's a reasonably quiet car to sit in. It's got some really comfortable seats. Some of the things you'll read about this car, one of the things I read about this car was that a lot of people thought this driver's seat was set too high. I don't. And I'm six foot tall and I have a long back, but I've still got some headroom. Um, and my vision is sort of right in the centre of the windscreen, so it's not affecting my vision and view out. The other complaint is that this centre mirror, the rear view mirror, takes up a lot of your view out of the windscreen. I'd sort of accept that, but for driving really, well, that's nice. 
<laughs> Looks like he bought it brand new as well. I think my view out is perfectly acceptable. There's a little bit of a blind spot here, but the effective area of your view is, is this area here when you're looking off to the left. You know, the camera position there, for example, doesn't affect my view out at all. So I'm not too fussed about this, and it's a good rear view mirror, automatic dipping. I don't really have any issues with it. The seats are very comfortable. There aren't really many compromises that you make with this car. The back seats are a bit cramped. Probably just for children only. We've got two, two grandchildren, they're, they're 10 and four. It's perfect for them. The dashboard's nicely laid out. Traditional instruments, ref counter, speedo, fuel gauge. Can't really see anything more that you want in that respect. And it does that. <laughs> Servicing comes around a bit quick in this car, every 6,000 miles, but the 6,000 mile service is just a safety check, and we've bought a service pack with it anyway, so not going to lose too much sleep about that. Oh, there's one other thing about this car, before I forget. If there was a ratio of car's performance to aggressiveness of the horn, this car will be right at the bottom of the pile, right at the bottom of the list. Listen to this. <laughs> I used the horn briefly yesterday and that never stopped amusing me all the way back. <laughs> I'm never going to upset anybody using that, am I? <laughs> So that's it for this video, hope oh, you enjoyed it, that's the new car, the GR Yaris, let me know what you think, maybe you've got one of these, let me know what you think of it as a long term owner, what's it been like to run, you'll be seeing quite a bit more of this car, I'll be making quite a few videos in this over the next few years, so get used to it. Don't forget to go and have a look at the website, reglocal.com. Loads more information there about advanced and performance driving and riding. Uh, some stuff about the books that I've written and how you can get all the copy. And also how you can get a day's driver or rider coaching with me. If you fancy a, a drive out or a ride out on some of these roads, drop me an email, let me know, we'll sort of something out. But for now, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.